Um, we're going to continue with uh, two uh, beautiful and smart women. Um, the first <laughs> one, Suzanne Sebens, uh, who is a professor of uh, experimental cancer research and director of the Institute of Experimental Cancer Research at Kiel in the north of Germany. Uh, Suzanne is also uh, an evolutionary uh, biologist and uh, a specialist of uh, dormancy in malignant cells. And this will be the topic uh, of her talk, uh, Dormancy, an Evolutionary Key Phenomenon in Cancer Development. Yeah, thank you very much Fred, for this kind introduction. It's really a great honor to be here and a great pleasure to share with you some of our insights uh, into the role of dormancy in the evolution of pancreatic cancer. However, I have to admit I'm not an evolutionary biologist, rather coming from the field of applied cancer research, however, uh, I'm convinced that applying and considering evolutionary principles in cancer re research will help us to find new avenues in order to improve the situation of cancer patients. Yeah. And I also have to uh, thank my former speakers because they really perfectly paved the way for my uh, presentation. And I would like to start with a situation which has been already mentioned. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's okay, sir. Um, uh, so I would like to start with a clinical situation which has been already mentioned. So most of the cancer patients will die sooner or later from their cancer disease, and they do not die from the primary tumor. They die from the local relapses or metastasis. And here you can see uh, a typical picture of uh, clinical evolution of a cancer disease. So uh, the cancer disease is diagnosed, then uh, the patient receives a treatment, and in the best situation, we have no visible signs of the cancer burden. However, in dependence on the cancer entity and the patient, uh, local relapses and metastasis will develop already after months or years, or even decades, um, as in the case of breast cancer. And the reason for this can be seen in vital but so-called dormant cancer cells which are, very, which are in very low cell number. And that's the reason why they are below the detection limit uh, which is given by our current detection measures. So uh, in order to improve this dismal situation, we need a better understanding of this phenomenon. And uh, what is dormancy? So dormancy is defined as a reversible quiescent stage and this can affect uh, single cells which undergo a growth arrest in dependence on the survival or on the environmental factors or it can also affect a tumor mass in which we have a balance between proliferating slowly, slowly proliferating cells and dying cells and this balance can be achieved by the presence of a limited number of blood vessels and thereby a limited excess to nutrients, growth factors, or oxygen, or by the presence of immune cells that detect and eliminate uh, highly immunogenic tumor cells while sparing the truly immunogenic ones. And uh, we have ample evidence that acquisition of further epigenetic or genetic alterations or alterations of the microenvironment will change this uh, situation, will lead to a reawakening of this quiescent stage, leading to a proliferation boost, and thereby we have the outgrowth of visible metastasis. So most of our knowledge we have so far is based on research in, in breast cancer. However, we still not sufficiently understood what are the factors and conditions that determine the entry into this dormant stage and uh, the reversal of this. And interestingly, dormancy is not a cancer-specific phenomenon rather than it's highly conserved in species evolution. In fact, many species such as mammals, amphibia, plants, fungi, bacteria, only to name a few, can enter a dormant phase or express long-lasting his history stages such as hibernation, diapause, dower stages, or spores. And as in cancer, so as I said, it was uh, first described in breast cancer, but meanwhile these dormant cancer cells have been also identified for many other ca cancer entities. So entering this dormant stage, 
allows an organism to perfectly adapt to adverse conditions, for example, to a lack of nutrients, low oxygen levels, unfavorable temperatures, or pH values, and this also applies uh, to the cancer cell. So for example, if a cancer cell leaves a primary context, enters the secondary context, the cell has to cope with unknown hostile conditions, and only those cells that are successful in adaptation to these conditions will then later on give rise to a metastasis. So these dormant stages uh, are, uh, excuse me, Uh, these dormant stages are associated with a profound resistance to many stressors, and this also applies to the cancer cells and is a big problem because uh, these cells um, are slowly proliferating. This may explain why they are not eliminated by chemotherapies, but beyond this, they express a plethora of mechanisms by which they are resistant to chemotherapy, but also are resistant to the attack by immune, by immune cells. So having this in mind, it's not surprising that these dormant stages are regarded as one of two prerequisites for life uh, in species evolution. And also in cancer evolution, meanwhile, this phenomenon is well appreciated. And in 2015, there was this nice review article in which dormancy has been postulated as another hallmark of cancer. So. Um, Regarding the role of these dormant stages, um, so on the one hand, it seems to be a highly effective strategy to survive under hostile conditions and thereby to ensure the persistence of uh, the population. However, this is at the cost of a reduced reproduction and growth. That means the population does not increase during this time and is very small. So we have to assume that the decision to enter or to exit this stage is uh, likely a subject of strong selection, and we do have to better understand what are the traits on the side of the cancer cells that determine uh, to enter and to exit this stage, and at the same time to better understand the selection forces that are given by the ecological niche. And uh, this particular applies to such cancers that are still or still have a very dismal prognosis such as pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, shortly PDAC, which is in the focus of our research. So to give you some facts on this tumor entity, so it's the fourth most common lethal tumor entity in Western countries, and it's estimated to be the second one by 2030. Risk factors that are associated with the development of this type of cancer is a high age, smoking, chronic pancreatitis, diabetes mellitus and adipositas. That means all conditions that are associated with a clinical or subclinical inflammation in the body. Due to the lack of specific symptoms and specific biomarkers, the disease is commonly diagnosed at advanced stages, often with metastasis, and the liver represents the main site of metastasis. And even those patients that can undergo surgery uh, and then obtain an adjuvant chemotherapy often relapse and develop metastasis within one year. So here we have really a very dismal prognosis and we better need to understand uh, the phenomenon that contribute to the metastatic, metastatic disease. So uh, when we started the project, there was almost nothing known uh, with respect to dormancy in this tumor entity. So that we asked the question, do PDEC cells become dormant in the liver? And if so, how do these cells adapt to and grow in this uh, new microenvironment? And we postulated that inflammation is an important trigger boosting or changing this dormant stage into a proliferative stage and then boosting metastatic outgrowth. And uh, when talking about inflammation of the liver, one cell population is of key voting importance, and these are the hepatic stellate cells, HSC, which only account for up to 5 to 10% of the entire liver cell population. However, upon injury and infection, these cells transdifferentiate 
into hepatic myofibroblasts, and these cells are major source of extracellular matrix proteins, growth factors, inflammatory mediators, and by this they promote and sustain the inflammation of this organ. So, so to do so, um, we used a syngenic pancreatic cancer model and used aging as an inflammatory trigger. And also here we used mice of different age. On the one hand, eight weeks old mice resembling a young adult in human beings. And on the other hand, 52 weeks old mice resembling the median age of diagnosis of PDAC in human beings. That means 70 to 75 um, years. Both groups of mice received an intrapancreatic inoculation of syngenic pancreatic cancer cells. And after two and four weeks, we assessed the tumor burden, metastasis, and signs of liver inflammation. So here you can see the results from the two weeks time point. So the primary tumors were very small in size, um, as you can also hear uh, on these bioluminescence imaging pictures. And most importantly, there were no difference differences between the two groups. We also could not detect any differences with respect to the number of disseminating tumor cells we could detect in the livers. However, the aged liver showed a higher percentage of proliferating cells within these disseminating tumor cells. So our conclusion from this is that aging does not impact the homing of the tumor cells, but impacts on the proliferative activity of the cells that have colonized the organ. We then used the livers to assess the signs of inflammation, and in line with the uh, literature, we could detect higher levels of many inflammatory mediators in the aged mice, and what was most strikingly different uh, were the levels of the vascular endothelial growth factor, VGF, which is known to be a proangiogenic factor. This was increased in the aged livers. However, we also find some factors being more elevated in the young livers, such as MIP2 and LIX, which are homologs of the human IL-8. So please keep in mind IL-8 and VGF because this will play a role later on. How was the situation four weeks after the tumor cell inoculation? So here you can see the primary tumors were slightly larger in the aged animals. But most strikingly, in the livers, we could detect a higher number of disseminating tumor cells. And most importantly, in these livers, we could detect the micrometastasis, which was m almost absent in the young livers. So from these experiments, our conclusion was that the disseminated pancreatic cancer cell show an enhanced metastatic outgrowth in the aged inflamed livers and that a physiological microenvironment may help to restrain the outgrowth of these cells. So then we went uh, in vitro in order to elucidate the underlying mechanism and we used uh, various cell lines harboring different PDEC associated mutations in order to mimic the evolution from a precursor to an invasive carcinoma. And today I will focus here on the results obtained with the cell line. The cells were co cultured for six days in an indirect co culture system, either in the presence of murine hepatic stellar cells, in order to mimic a physiological uninflamed liver microenvironment or in the presence of hepatic myofibroblasts in order to mimic an inflamed liver microenvironment. And we have chosen this indirect co-culture system in order to elucidate the role of soluble factors on the growth behavior of the tumor cells. So determination of the vital cell number revealed that we had a significant lower number of vital cells when the tumor cells were cultured in the presence of the hepatic stellar cells. And this nicely fit together with our results obtained in the in vivo model, where we got almost no micrometastases in the young liver. We then further characterized uh, these cells and could see that uh, also the number of proliferating cells were much lower under these physiological liver conditions. And if you have a look here on this PI67 staining, we could detect here these enlarged, flattened cells 
which were enriched under these HSC conditions, and this is a typical sign for quiescent cells. Also in line with this, uh, the ratio of the activated form of the MAP kinase ERK to the MAP kinase P38 was reduced by the expression of the cell cycle inhibitor P21 was enhanced and also the number of cells being positive for the nescence associated beta galactosidin. <coughs> so all these features here are indicative for a quiescent stage. However, if we talk about dormancy, this quiescent stage has to be reversible. And in order to test this, we set up this co-culture model in the presence of a live cell imaging unit in order to monitor the growth behavior of the tumor cells in real time. And we started uh, co-culture in the presence of the hepatic stellate cells to mimic the physiological liver conditions. And in one approach, we prolonged these conditions, while in the other one, we switched the conditions from physiological to inflamed liver by switching the HSCs to HMF. What happened? So this is shown here, after prolongation of these physiological liver conditions, these cells exhibiting this flattened cell quiescent phenotype hardly start to proliferate. Only quite minority of these cells did so. Uh, however, the situation was completely different after switching uh, the liver conditions. Here we could see that almost 70% of these quiescent cell cells started to divide and were positive for PI67. So the conclusion from this is that pancreatic cancer cells can adopt a dormant phenotype in a physiological liver microenvironment by when these conditions are changing and we have an enrichment by hepatic myofibroblasts. This boosts the awakening and the proliferative activity. So then we wanted to know what are the soluble factors that confer these different phenotypes. And we did a multiplex analysis of the co-culture supernatants. And here on the left-hand side, you see the factors being more elevated under the HSC co-culture, which were murine IL-6, uh, IL human IL-8, and murine IL-12. While under the inflamed conditions, we could identify VGF as well as SGF1 alpha. So we then performed a lot of blocking experiments in order to identify whether these factors are involved. And it turned out that antibody-mediated neutralization of IL-8 under these uh, uninflamed conditions could increase the number of viable cells, and most importantly, it led to a reduction of these senescent cells. Vice versa, when we neutralize the activity of the VGF under the inflamed conditions, we could significantly reduce the number of viable cells and also the number of proliferating cells. And similar op results could be obtained when we performed also these blocking experiments in this co-culture model. That means when we change the conditions from uninflamed to inflamed conditions, then we applied this antibody and also here we could see a reduction in the number of viable cells and also in the number of proliferating cells. So our conclusion from this is that VGF is not only a proangiogenic factor, rather than a factor that mediates the reawakening of these dormant cells and leads to a boost of proliferation. So as we have already heard, uh, when we talk about initiation of a tumor, tumor stem cells are regarded to be essential because these cells have the unique ability to self-renew and to give rise to differentiated cells. So uh, we next uh, looked whether also the stem cell properties are impacted by these different uh, hepatic stromal conditions. And as you can see here, we first started an expression analysis of four different stem cell markers that had been associated with PDEC development. And as you can see here, the expression was always higher uh, in cells that have been co-cultured in the presence of the stellate cells and was lower when cultured with an inflammatory counterpart. In line with this, we also determined uh, the colony formation ability, which gives you an information about the self-renewal capacity. And also here we could 
a higher colony formation uh, in the presence uh, of the hepatic stellate cells. And a further analysis of the formed colonies also revealed um, that under these conditions, we have more formation of colonies that contain a higher number of stem cells. While, for example, these power clone cells or power clones are supposed to contain more differentiated cells and less stem cells. Yeah? So, uh, again, under these HFC conditions, we have a enrichment of these colonies that are supposed to contain a high number of stem cells. So the conclusion from this is that under these physiological liver conditions, uh, stem cell properties are maintained and uh, therefore might be another reason why these conditions may favor or promote the uh, maintenance of cells that have, have the ability to grow or to metastasis. So finally, of course, we wanted to know whether uh, these cells indeed have a tumorigenic potential. And to do so, we performed a single cell cloning of these holoclone and paraclone cells, which we have enriched after this HSC co-culture. After expansion, we inoculated 10,000 cells of either clone intrasplenically into deep gauge mice. And then we monitored the tumor growth of a period of around five months. And as you can see here, the inoculation of the paraclone cells, that means containing our low numbers of stem cells, only led to formation of a pancreatic and lung tumor in one of 10 animals, while inoculation of the holoclone cells led to, tum to a tumor formation in seven of 10 animals, so that we conclude that these cells that are enriched under HSC co-culture indeed exhibit stem cell properties and are tumorigenic. So with this slide, I would like to uh, give a short summary. So the sh very short summary would be context matters. A more detailed uh, <laughs> summary uh, is that our data uh, support the view that pancreatic cancer cells that seed a physiological liver microenvironment can adapt a dormant phenotype and the, these microenvironmental conditions uh, favor the acquisition of this dormant phenotype along with the maintenance of stem cell properties. And IL-1, IL-8 is one factor which mediates uh, this dormant stage. However, if we have microenvironmental changes, for example, due to aging, to exposure to lifestyle factors such as alcohol, smoking, but maybe also the surgical removal of the primary tumor. And here we have now ample evidence that this surgical treatment massively induced inflammation in the liver uh, might lead to a transdifferentiation of the hepatic stellate cells into hepatic myofibroblasts. We have an elevation of VEGF and thereby this leads to a reversal of the dormant phenotype a boost of <coughs> proliferation and thereby to an outgrowth of a visible metastasis. So I would like to end my presentation uh, to discuss with you what might be the best strategy to target these dormant cancer cells because uh, targeting these cells might help to improve this dismal situation for the cancer patients. So uh, having in mind that entering a dormant stage is a very effective strategy to ensure the survival of the population, of course, it's quite easy. We have to get rid of these cells. How can we do this? We can directly target them to eliminate them. However, for this, we need specific targets, and this we still not have. And having in mind that these dormant cells may have also stem cell properties and we might use these stem cell markers. We need to use markers that are not found on normal stem cells because this would harm also the patients. Another strategy would be to reactivate uh, the dormant stage so that the cells get into this proliferative stage and to make them more vulnerable to chemotherapy. However, here we have the risk of an uncontrolled disease progression because even those cells that are proliferating might not respond to chemotherapy due to the existence of many other uh, uh, resistance strategies. 
assuming that uh, entering a dormant stage is at the cost of a reduced reproduction and growth, uh, the population size is very small. It's so small that it's not detected by our clinical detection measures. And at this size, of course, this population does not harm the patient. So another strategy would be we maintain these dormant states in the tumor cells. However, this would mean we <coughs> do not cure the patient, rather than we achieve a manageable quantification, of course, also with the risk that these cells can reawaken and then grow out again. Um, at the moment, I cannot give you any recommendation what would be the best strategy. I think we need much more knowledge on this phenomenon. As I said, what are the requirements from the tumor cells and what are the conditions given by the microenvironment? And then we know how we can, uh, what might be the best strategy. So with this, I'm at the end. And <laughs> the uh, context is not only important for the evolution of cancer, but also for uh, cancer research. So here you can see all the people I have to thank for their contribution and their support. Our collaboration partners, my group, in particular, Lennart, Lauritz, Maren, and Fabrice. I have shown you the results from them. And of course, our funding partners and you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne.